Alright everybody, so let's start talking about anti-predator adaptations. Now we can take, we can see that many species have um, adaptations against predators and we can um, kind of group them into a variety of different categories. Um, and one of the things is behavioral defenses. That's one of those categories. And I've used this in other classes in my introduction to ecology course. So if you've seen these lectures, um, well, enjoy them again, I guess, or uh, skip ahead. But what I wanted to, I, I, I think it would be a good idea for us to look at these so we can kind of all start getting on the same page. Now, uh, behavioral defenses are things that um, organisms do to, you know, change their behavior to stay away from predators. Now we can see this really easily, this little shark here running through this school of fish and they swim away uh, and keep away from the shark and they don't want to get anywhere near it. Okay, so spatial avoidance. Um, now spatial avoidance can be at a variety of different scales. So whether, um, you know, these fish are not moving very far, but they might be um, uh, other species that need to go farther away or um, they might avoid them based on time. So um, they, you know, if the predators are ha out hunting at a certain time, certain species might not go out because they don't want to get eaten. Um, alarm calls are another example of these behavioral defenses where species will um, call out and warn other members of their group so that they can um, try to avoid the, the predator. Um, reduced activity, right? So th it's very hard to see this deer. What predator is going to be able to see this deer here in that um, uh, in that little thicket because they're, they're and they're not going to get that deer is not going to get eaten, right? Um, now, chemical defenses are another example where we see you know the skunk is a great example. Here is a skunk um, spraying its uh, bad smelling uh, liquid to scare away a predator. Um, Hagfish slime is another example where if you grab a hold of a hagfish, it'll create all this slime that will gunk up the, the mouth of a fish. Um, you know, caterpillars, all sorts of brightly colored caterpillars have um, chemicals that either they taste really bad um, and have toxins or they you know, have toxins that they'll inject into you as you touch them. Uh, this is one of my favorites. This is a slow loris. It has a little claw on its um, back leg. I can't remember if it's its front or back legs now that it can um, use and it um, is a, a irritating chemical that gets injected. It's not really necessarily a venom but it keeps um, organisms away from from eating them. Another example is warning coloration. Okay, when you see these organisms, you might be like, oh, these are scary, right? Uh, my son Jordy just got stung by his first wasp the other day, and it was a terrible experience for him. And now, um, well, we kind of turned it into a, let's learn about wasps. So he's um, liking that, but, you know, he has ingrained in his head from that one time he got stung by that wasp do not touch wasps, right? Any yellow and black insect that he sees, he just freezes in place and says, daddy, daddy, daddy. And, um, you know, he knows very clearly that um, yellow and black insects are bad. Um, and th so why are yellow and in black insects known to be bad? They're using a strategy called Mullerian mimicry. This umlaut here over the U means Mullerian. Um, it's a German pronunciation, but um, it's saying that, um, well, what, what Mullerian mimicry is, it's saying that there's a variety of species that all use the same strategy that are either unpalatable or dangerous, okay? So unpalatable meaning, you know, they might have some toxins in them and you can't eat them. But in this case, we're talking about the stinging of a hornet, a, um, 
a honeybee or a wasp, they're all, you know, have that bad stinger and can really, um, you know, people know, and it's not just people know that these black and yellow insects are bad. It's also, you know, animals that are going out and trying to, um, they, they won't attack these insects because they know. So all, you know, lots of stinging insects have this black and yellow coloration. Now, this thing I haven't talked about yet is a hoverfly. It is using Batesian mimicry, which is a little different. And what that um, organism is doing, it's, um, it's fine. It's not dangerous at all. It's actually a fly. You can see it only has two wings. It's more closely related to a housefly. Um, it's in the same group. It's not in the Hymenoptera, the, the, the wasp and bee uh, group, wasp and bee order, I should say. Um, and they're yellow and black, but people and other bugs leave them alone because they think they're going to get stung by them when, you know, they're just cute little flies that don't do anything. Um, another example of the Mullerian mimicry is poison dart frogs, right? So these brightly colored flags, frogs have um, a poison that will not, um, wouldn't necessarily hurt you. Uh, there are some frogs. Uh, most of them wouldn't hurt an adult human, but um, certainly when smaller predators will eat them, they uh, have a bad time and they're all kind of uh, protected by this bright coloration. Another example of a different type of strategy that organisms use to not get eaten is crypsis or camouflage. Um, looking either like something else. These aren't necessarily like camouflage, right? They're very, uh, th th these are tree hoppers that look like thorns. These are not thorns. Each in individual thing right here looks like a thorn is an insect that is on this, this plant. And, um, you know, organisms just don't think of them. Um, they don't see them. Uh, as is insects as food even though they might you know they're pretty conspicuous it's very easy to see these things but it's not like um but they look like something else here's another example of a caterpillar it's white and black and when you see white and black on a leaf you probably instantly think bird poop right but this is actually a caterpillar here um whereas camouflage is slightly different same kind of strategy but um working a little different. So this is a lizard here. And what you can see is here's an eye, here's the other eye, here's the mouth, and then the front leg and five fingers are right there. Uh, back leg is hard to see, it's right in here. Uh, but it's you know certainly not going to get eaten. It's very well camouflaged. Um, that being said, this might also be a predator um, predation adaptation also because that is um, definitely a more um, successful predator if no one can see it coming or you know nothing can see it hiding there and uh, bugs that are crawling up this um, tree are definitely going to get eaten. This is also one of my favorite um, anti-predator devices we see this is a lizard here's the um, here's the front arm here's the back leg um, here's the tail. I don't even know where the eye is. I can't really tell. Uh, I think that's a nostril there, but um, crazy insect or a crazy lizard that um, looks, you know, is extremely well camouflaged. Then we see structural defense. Structural defenses are extremely common, right? So these are shells. These are. Um, um, you know, beetles are a great example of their extremely hard shell for their size, right? It's nothing, you know, not as strong as a giant clam shell, but um, there's plenty of, of examples of shells all across um, lots of different phyla, right? Between turtles and uh, mollusks, all sorts of different mollusks and lots of different things. Um, so think of the, about the quills of a porcupine, spikes on the tail of a stegosaurus, um, warthog tusks. They're all going to be structures that organisms use to keep from 
um, getting getting predated upon. And they work quite well. All right, with that, we'll come back and we'll be talking a little bit about more about this, like our prey controlling controlled by predators. All right, see y'all later.